welcome to the STOA. Uh, the session of today's title is Planetary Dharma. And we have John Churchill visiting us today, who will be in conversation with uh, the STOA's very own embodied Shemka. Uh, I just Googled uh, how to do female shaman uh, before the session. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Skylar Brown. Um, and uh, I read the blurb of this uh, session uh, on the event copy. At this moment in history, the deep archetypal structures of the Eastern and Western psyches are meeting and this creative confluence of planetary synthesis, a fourth turning of the Dharma wheel is unfolding. And uh, that sounds very, uh, something the Stoa will host a uh, conversation. So I'm quite happy about this. And I'll, I'll take in uh, Skylar in a moment and she's gonna introduce John and they're gonna have a conversation for about 30 minutes. Then we'll pivot to Q and A. If you have questions anytime, just put in the chat. I'll call on you, come yourself, ask your question to uh, John. And if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that because this will be on YouTube. Um, so that being said, I'm going to take you and Skylar. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's so good to be here at the STOA uh, with John. And um, John is one of my teachers. He's my teacher of meditation and so much more. Um, and I, uh, I just felt compelled to um, catalyze this conversation and so glad you're here um i wanted to say a couple of things as a as an introduction to john and the first one is um how i came to study with john he is a teacher like i said a teacher of many things so i think over the course of the conversation he'll better define um i don't want to put labels on john's teaching because he's here to really share what it is that's alive for him right now um, but I was studying um, the well. I was studying many things. A very haphazard, shamanic, <laughs> um, apprentice-style path um, with many uh, strange mystical characters along the way. I was thinking this morning that it's like um, Gurdjieff's Meetings with Remarkable Men, which is one of my favorite books, actually. But I was sort of wandering the, on my journey, on my path, and and getting. Kind of blindsided left and right um though also encountering some really incredible teachings and and, and getting making my way towards wisdom um at a certain point in 2019 one of these mystical beings just looked at me and said you know if you keep going like this you're gonna lose your mind you've got to put the ground under what it is you're doing um, and I don't think I had really ever thought about the ground um, before that point. And it was such an important, it was a turning point for me. And, and I immediately started studying with John, went to a, ret a retreat he hosted in Boulder, um, which is where he lives. And um, so, so grateful to have had the last two years really deepening into my own practice, Vajrayana practice, Buddhism. Um, but like I said, so much more because um, there's a synthesis, as it said in the introduction, of the Western traditions and the mystery schools um, of the Western tra traditions, which, I mean, maybe you can tell by looking at me, but my, my um, you know, my lineage is Northern European and I was always very interested in alchemy and the mystery schools, but couldn't really square them with the the eastern trad traditions or the buddhism that i was very interested in and and also couldn't find the practices i was like how do you, how do you make the western tradition traditions a practicing path and um and this is a big part of what draws me to john's teachings and what feels really significant and important right now um and he said to me the title of um or, or john you i don't know if you'll remember this but you said to me at one point um I was really laboring, I was like really trying to figure out what, what my lineage is. And it, it felt, um, yeah, it felt unclear and it felt confusing. And some part of me needed to feel tied to or connected to something in the past. And John said, the, tra the tradition you and I are a part of hasn't been born yet. And that uh, little pith instruction, <laughs> just kind of broke open something in me it felt so true and it felt so exciting and it felt there was something about the past future aspect of what he said like it, the tradition hasn't been born yet 
And so um, that's why I've invited John here and um, just so grateful, John, for, for your teachings and wisdom and uh, want to get into it. Um, so maybe we'll start with, uh, I don't know, I, I shared a little bit about my, my very little bit about my path, but maybe you could share a little bit about how you got to be here talking about a planetary dharma. Mute. Okay, I'm muted. <laughs> Peter, Skyla, thank you. And uh, uh, thank you for welcoming me into your space. It's uh, an honor to be here. Um, a little bit about my path. Well, like, like many of you, I, I was uh, probably, you know, woke up pretty early on. Um, Grew up in the UK, um, pretty privileged. Um, well, no, not pretty. Very privileged uh, upbringing, um, and you know had a pretty strong uh, awakening as an adolescent. And uh, luckily, part of my family environment was supportive of that. I had a grandmother who was into Jung and Tai Chi and Zen, and I had been introduced to yoga and meditation at around 12 years old and dreams were analyzed on holidays. And so there was a supportive environment for, for that process. Um, and um, so by late adolescence, you know, my, my big questions were like, well, what the hell is going on? Because clearly um, our society is like veering off course and the experiences that have been revealed to me in terms of experience of what it meant to be a human being and what it meant to, to live the good life, there was a, a, big, a big distance between what I was seeing and what I was experiencing. And so like many of you, that led me on, a, on, on quite a journey, um, which involved uh, you know, studying the mystical traditions of the planet, uh, Western psychology, developmental psychology, psychodynamics, uh, Asian medicine, uh, alchemical medicine, Hatha yoga practice. Um, and uh, on that journey also uh, got married to my uh, best friend, Nicole, and you know, have a family, um, was trained, started training in the Indo-Tibetan tradition in the what's called Mahamudran Dzogchen uh, around 20 years old and uh, um, became a teacher in that tradition uh, maybe like a decade ago um, after completing a, an apprenticeship. Um, and, and really underneath all of that was uh, a and it, uh, an experience and a knowing that uh, what it is that we, we needed to see in, in the world around us already existed. It just hadn't returned back into form, if you will. The tradition um, hasn't, been, um, hasn't been manifested for a while. I mean, we don't have in our culture, we don't have much luck with, right, with uh, traditions and teachers and adepts, right? I mean, the great religious symbol in our culture is of an adept nailed to a cross. So nobody really wants to be involved in, you know, mystery teachings in the outer world in a culture where, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been precarious for a long time. Um, on the other hand, we're at a time in history where, you know, you can't get burnt at the stake anymore. I mean, you can get canceled, um, so um, yeah, like the I see my work as, as as part of the bringing together of that fourth turning, which, frankly, from my perception, has existed for a long time. It's just there hasn't been a fertile uh, field for it to land into. Mm, I love that it's existed for a long time. Um, maybe could you describe or define, John, like what do you mean by fourth turning, just basically? 
Uh, well, if we, we could we could say in a number of different ways. I mean, there's a, um, I mean, first, even from a kind of pers perspectival issue, you know, first person, second person, third person, fourth person, just fourth person perspective is a contextual perspective, recognizing that Dharma arises within certain cultures and through certain teachers. So just archetypally the number four developmentally is just a reflection on, oh, context is important. But within the cycles of, of Buddha Dharma, traditionally, and of course they break it down differently, but the first turning is related to really addressing one's own individual traumatic reactivity. So how trauma exists within one's own individual body mind. Um, and the second turning really pertains more to the first turning refers to kind of purifying deep affective and somatic um, distortions and reactivity brought about by multi-generational trauma. The second turning has got to do with also the purification of cognition, um, understanding the constructed nature of the self and the body and time and space and duality. So that opens up a, 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 um, a recognition of a, of a much deeper kind of, of awareness that's, that is uh, field oriented and interconnected. Whilst this first phase tends to be packaged more in time and space and individual, uh, um, Body mind. The second it opens one up to some to a much more of a of a me we experience, and then the third turning, which was the Buddha nature schools, was really looking at um, the idea that there was a much deeper essential nature. I guess you could say it's holographic. So rather than field, res rather than a resonant field model, the, the Buddha nature school is more holographic, where time and space itself are collapsed and essence and effort everything is always already right here right now and ideally those are those are those have to be stacked right they're meant to they're meant to be interpenetrative vehicles we see a lot of problems when they're not like when you get into higher teachings and the personal trauma isn't dealt with right and by fourth training really what we mean what i mean and what's I think one of my mentors, Ken Wilber, means is that we have now the stream of, of Western Buddhism coming in. And by Buddhism here, I mean like the, the deep, well-motivated study to alleviate suffering, personally, biochemically, structurally, culturally, and systemically. So Dharma is about the alleviation of suffering and about understanding like the good the true and the beautiful and how that manifests itself. And of course we've manifested that in the West, you know? And so um, when I think of Dharma and Buddhism, we're talking about those teachings which help you know, liberate human beings. And so even, you know, Western psychology has a lot to say about um, how the process of, of awakening and of healing, you know, what some of the integral people say, the process of like cleaning up and waking up and growing up, showing up, how these, you know, how these come together. So, um, and, and also there is a huge wealth of understanding within our tradition, within the Western tradition, right? you know, within the streams of from Greece, within the Druidic streams, within the Egyptian streams, um, and then even the, the mystical traditions like the Kathas, and then the, you know, the more alchemical traditions like the Rosicrucians. Uh, if you're, if you're a, a contemplative scientist, then you need to, one needs to be informed by all of these traditions because they're all addressing the same issue from different perspectives. So, you know, as, as a, Western Dharma practitioners as people committed to a, you know, liberation, personal, cultural, systemic, all of those uh, fields need to be brought to bear in understanding uh, Dharma.
I have, there's so many ways this can go and uh, we will have Q and A. So everybody, <laughs> let's, let's all take it where we want to go. But um, yeah. I guess, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, you know, I guess one of the things that um, uh, I have uh, studied a lot of um, trauma, you know, the healing of personal and collective and generational trauma with teachers like Thomas Hubel, who is amazing. And um and, and then as I began to learn some of the Tantra, I recognized that these were, these are trauma, these are practices to release trauma in the system. And I remember um, you talking about or giving a presentation once about Tantra and alchemy. And um, it just, I mean, maybe you could say a little bit more. I mean, you mentioned that these Western traditions have this wisdom that the wisdom that they have, they, that these streams are really important to integrate. Mm -hmm. um, why hasn't it happened? I mean, I have my suspicions. Like for me, for example, as a, as a, a you know, I have to go back through witch trials basically mm -hmm. to get to my tradition, to get to my indigeneity. I have to, like, that's some of the trauma that I'm working through, um, and so. Yeah, maybe you could just say a little bit more about the situation and how, like, how can we integrate some of some of these stream, these other streams? So you mentioned trauma here. Just, just like, just personally, if if one, if we are, if we are wanting to grow personally and we have trauma that we don't know about or that's hidden, then that has a huge effect on the defenses, on our defenses and on our, on what we're willing to see and what we're willing to not see, right? And, and so for instance, let's say we've had horrific trauma around certain aspects of our spiritual journey, all of us here, let's say, we would we might not want to look like one might not want to look at those things um i mean here we're already opening up like a perspective from the traditions which we can look at pragmatically and we can also look at this kind of um as a, as reality like basically the idea of reincarnation that um the, it's difficult to open up certain um, cities without at least pragmatically taking that on as a as a um, as a kind of a an as if, right? Because, because uh, at least historically, you could say we we exist in terms of our you know we it's taken us fourteen billion years to at least sit here physically. And so our, you know, ancestral, we, we've been through quite a journey ancestrally. And so knowing historically and spiritually what happened at those various stages, which is also the way I like to think of it is like, well, those dimensions of who we are are sitting here right now. So for personally, for instance, if like there's a, if, if I, you know, if I don't recognize that the burning of the, of the, uh, the library is at Alexandria as is, is as real as like the storming of, con, con, you know, of storming in January, that those things are as equally as real, you know, because we remember what we, what we feel, what we, um, what we love, right? And so our awakening to our history, right? And the sacred history is an important, is an, and, and the trauma is involved in that. Um, so that that's that's a an important perspective because it also, as I said, pragmatically speaking, it opens up the capacity to receive information beyond this little lifetime. Um, I have to. Say, this feels so important, John, just because I think because you're also saying this happens collect collectively, right? There's a collective veiling. We've we've had a collective veiling, absolutely. I mean, as I said to you, if you look at the research on meditation, for instance, 
99.99% of that is on Eastern traditions. Now, now, like, if you're like, oh, that's interesting. As a reason, like, well, but that's beyond, like, um, random. That's, like, such a high that you make, you, it, one begins to start, like, questioning, well, why is, you know, why is that? Um, so just wee me back a little bit because I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I think maybe we could get to because I would, you know, what is the planetary Dharma? Where are we now in this fourth turning? What, do, what are some of the qualities or the characteristics? And obviously okay. it's emergent. Yes. And so, right. but, you know, I mean, even for me, like the communal aspect, the, the collective aspect of this sure. turning, the importance of the Sangha. Okay, so let me, so within the Tibetan tradition, there's a number of different kinds of teachings. You have essence teachings, which looks purely at the nature of mind. And the best example of that is Dzogchen and what's called essence Mahamudra, which are really about shifting through particular, shifting beyond um, psychological structures to a, a much deeper, more opening, a more open vantage point. And then you have the tantras. And then the highest of those tantras arguably is the color chakra, what's called the time wheel. So when we talk about a planetary dharma, we're talking about the time wheel teachings. And the time wheel teachings aren't just like, they're not Tibetan, they are, they're a planetary teaching, right? Meaning the context of them you got to remember that, like in the in a Tibet in a traditional environment, one would be initiated through. You know, you don't just one would be initiated through a, a phase stages of initiation as those worlds were kind of opened up. But it's you know one of the one of the perspectives of the mystery schools is that the cycles of time that we live in are like much larger. And that the rise and falls of civilizations have been got, are happen on a on a much different on a very different scale than the one that the royal society you know whatever <laughs> you know there's a, there's a bubble that we've existed within in terms of um, in terms of history. So that um, so within that understanding of color chakra, within that understanding of the time wheel teachings, this is where you get. The, the understanding of like the kind of archetypal seasons of of the newer sphere. This is where like astrology, but I mean like astrology is a sophisticated science, not as some sort of like predict, you know, predict. And when we talk about the the fourth turning, you're talking this has got to do related to this Piscean Aquarian transition that astrologers talk about. And um the shifting from something that's more mystical and kind of vague to something that's much more scientific. Uh, and um, uh, how would you say? Um, precise. And so lo no longer a mystery, but a science. And in terms of it, and, and in terms of its dimensions, of course, we have like the contemplative dimension, there's a psychological dimension. There's that there's the the the, the, um, the social technologies right in terms of right relationship you know, how do we um, how do we discover new ways of of living together I mean from my perspective all of these teachings are really aimed at helping us like how do we come together and live together right that's Right. I mean, there might be a process of enlighten, you know, of enlightening, but at the end of the day, it's about well, how does that help us come to come together and, and live together in a new and different way? Um, and that, you know, within the understanding of it of the time wheel traditions, we've been seeing that process in Western civilization for a thousand years as we've been shedding off the church and like you know the aristocracy and fighting for human rights and so that that process is is seen as part of the unfolding and the awakening of of the planet and the color chakra and the the time that those those teachings see 
the nature of time as an awakening process, right? That the, the planet itself and the solar system are part of a much larger body that just like we awaken, the planets awaken, solar systems awaken. Right? Yeah, I think um, probably we can call for questions so that we get other people's, yeah. Peter, I haven't been watching the chat. It's, it's something, it looks like something from Sam came in. Yeah, I can uh, um, pop in and administer the questions. Uh, anyone has any questions anytime, just put them in the chat and I'll call on you. Um, and uh, Sam, you had a question. If you can unmute yourself. I think you're, I can't, I can't hear you, Sam. Uh, about now. Yes. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks for joining us, John. Um, I guess I'm just curious. Th this is something I've been wrestling with lately. And as I'm hearing you describe this fourth turn as a really kind of integrative approach, weaving together and braiding these many lineages, I'm curious how this stands in relation to this notion that in spiritual practice and endeavors, it's um, also good to have fidelity to a certain tradition, the whole idea that if you wanna strike water, um, persist at a certain well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how, yeah, how does that relate to what you're um, offering here? Well, that's a great question. First, one did one does need to understand like what's the core skeletal structure, right? So, um, one, once we have a, a deep sense of the contemplative engineering, and by that I mean like really at least having mastered one system, and also understanding that different systems were constructed by different teachers based on their typology. So there's a lot to be said for, for the perspective that you're offering, right? And, 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 and that if we don't put those, if you don't put those systems on the table and you look at like how they were developed and what the context was, right? You know, then you're, it's going to be, you won't, we are not going to discover what is the system that we are going to need. Now, you have, you know, the mastery, obviously this one needs to have a certain degree of mastery. And so there are, there is core contemplative skills, right? And, um, you know, and the Indo-Tibetan tradition has a pretty good sense of that core contemplative skill, right? Um, so, However, <laughs> um, there's a lot in those, there's a lot in those traditions, which is also cultural context and, temp and context in time and space. So, you know, we're blessed, I'm blessed with having like, we've had the, te you know, Western teachers who did that, right? So um, you mentioned, uh, Skylar, that you're at, a blue spirit and there's a, a buddhist teachers con a buddhist conference of the buddhist western elders so we've already had one generation who kind of like really went in deep right and so at least i would personally i was i was like well that's a blessing because i don't we don't have to do that i don't have to do that like it's more like that's not mine to do <laughs> right like as a contemplative psychologist what i was interested in is what is the deep structure and then master that deep structure Right? And, and then be like uh, realistic, you know, like about whether you've done that or not, right? Um, right, you need to learn to calm the mind, definitely, right? One needs to learn to have a deep experience, a deep embodiment, right? The heart needs to be opened up wide. But in terms of the cognitive, metacognitive skills, that's really about being able to see through the structures of self and body and emotion, see through the structures of time and space, see through the structures of individual consciousness, um, 
once you open up a level of, of mind beyond time and space, and you know, within the Tibetan tradition, it's understand if you then continue to study, okay, you open up um, what's called buddhi, or in the tradition, what we would call direct, valid, or well, valid non-conceptual cognition. It's, it's, it's basically intuition, but, but that would be a, a fuzzy term where that awakened mind becomes fused with cognition, right? And so Wilbur talks about this as being what he would call supermind. So yes, you do have, you need to get to a certain point, <laughs> but at that point, then cognition can be fused back into awakened mind. So yeah, you have to get through some system of training, but based on what's your, like, what's your typology, and do you know what the best system of training, what would be the best system of training for a certain typology? For instance, there are certain defenses that are very, very narrow psychologically, okay? And if you look at the history of Buddhism, you have things like uh, the, the Vishuddha Maga, which Buddha Gosa de wrote down. This is like 400 years after the Buddha with a very high emphasis on this very narrow, very deep concentration. Now, the problem is, is everybody thinks that that's what everybody should do without realizing, well, actually, maybe Buddha Gosa was on the spectrum. Like, like meaning, I'm serious. I mean, there are certain, like, if you have a defense that's very narrow, that's going to work great for you. But what if you have a different type of system? So even, even being able to kind of analyze what works for who that's an important planetary dharma kind of fourth turning analysis, if that makes sense. Yeah. Any follow-up share, Sam? Uh, yeah, just want to say that was, that was clarifying and kind of opened things up. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you. And it, it gives me a lot to think about and a lot to, to dig into. Um, so it's good to have those threads. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we're, we're not going to go order in the how the questions are arriving, uh, but Katie, you're you're next. Hi, John. Hi, Katie. Nice to meet you. To meet you. Good to meet um, you too. Okay, I have like a zillion questions, but I'll try to narrow it down to to just one. And I noticed you mentioned having an awakening experience when you were a teenager, and something I've been thinking about a lot recently is that in these kind of earlier turnings awakening is modeled as a series of events like one way kind of turnstiles that one mm -hmm. goes through like there's the Theravada mm -hmm. four path model and then in these later turnings that um, you were talking about where everything is kind of in the field all the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the task is the, ta the task is mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. tune into the Buddha nature that's always there um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about how you think about an awakening process in these later models um, and particularly from a perspective of like what's changing in the system in your view in the like psychobiological substrate of the human tell me a little bit more about that last bit what's changing that this is a great question yeah, yeah. i'm really curious about this so there are people who are trying to model say in the earlier uh systems you know what does a pre-stream entry versus a post-stream entry brain mm -hmm. look like mm -hmm. and how can we take you know a biological system that has not hit stream entry and use all of the tools that we have available to us now in addition mm -hmm. to just using language loops but using you know putting energy into the brain and like mm -hmm. all these other things mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to move the system along towards mm -hmm. stream entry for example mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the biology of a more sort of Dzogchen Mahamudra way of mm -hmm, thinking mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. much less understood. And I'm just curious, mm -hmm. I kind of want you to speculate. Um, okay, we did it, like, yes. What do you think is changing there? So yeah. we we did, Dr. Dan Brown and myself, we did a, stu a study. There is a study that we did on the stages of Mahamudra where we articulated pretty clearly if you pull it up, it's on like it's it's a it's a it was a groundbreaking study. That's the EEG study, right? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Whether. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a very different kind of uh, awakening, right? It's a very different kind of brain process. It's a very different kind of chemistry. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you can have yeah, you can have that awakening without fully having completed that Theravada process, right? This is a little bit like from, from a kind of trans incarnational perspective, you can wake up to a deeper basis of operation, a deeper identity without having fully cleaned out this lifetime. So from my perspective, the, 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 the Theravada model clean is, it really cleans out like the 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 bio the bio epigenetic momentum of 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 transgenerational trauma on a kind of very like chemical level um, those other those other are are finer right they are more you know, they just yeah they're they're a diff, just a different system um, how they interact with one another is very interesting. Um, and part of in my own you know contemplative practice and research, I mean that's that's part of with a fourth turning model. It's really learning how to integrate those different turnings in such a way that we get better results. Because there's some there's strengths of each of those systems um, and weaknesses. Right? Does that answer your question? Sort of. I okay. mean, I think it's a tr it's a tricky question. I don't know the answer to it either. Um, but I'm curious how you would how you would try to measure it. I mean, I know you did the EEG stuff, um, mm -hmm. but the way that, as far as I know, the way that the participants got recruited for that paper is the teachers kind of pointed them out. They were like, "Yeah, this is a good one. This is a good one." So there wasn't like, you know, there's not a questionnaire yet. Uh, for this kind of thing. Oh, we 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 developed no, we developed a questionnaire. A, we developed a questionnaire. B, we had people practice exactly the same practice because they were mm -hmm. following, they were following point out instructions. So we we got um, everybody repeating exactly the same instruction, you know, basically all the way through. Um, so it was a it was a pretty good. Um, it was as I think it was as good as it we're gonna get right now. Oh, I definitely agree. Yeah. And I guess I guess I'm just curious. Like, let's see, what am I trying to ask you here? Do you think that aside from the EEG, mm -hmm. you know, the EEG correlates, do you think mm -hmm. there are kind of discernible waypoints along a path of awakening in these later models? Other discernible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. How people, I mean, depends upon the system. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not, a, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't mastered that fourth, four path model, right? So I still have work to do with that piece, which is, which is really related to developing right, a right metacognitive relationship with trauma on, on a, really you know and of course the more powerful the, the the trauma that you have the more work you have to do and, and the more difficult it is um but with those with the other systems definitely like when a, yeah you can track how people um how they talk their language structure like in, like, like with zen koans like someone starts talking and you, you 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 know you talk about time and how the person starts conceptualizing about time is it, it it tells you right there right like the the time space all of those kinds of um how they talk about how they're relating to other people whether though they're there or whether they're here <laughs> right like holo whether their kind of understanding is holographic or whether it's causal or whether it's systemic or metasystemic, all of those are things that you can track. And to some extent, various developmental, um, in Western psychology, you know, all of those systems of developmental psychology, there's various means of kind of, 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 of analyzing what level of complexity does somebody have, right? In terms of their ego complexity. Um, 
my understanding is the bodhisattva path itself, right, which is, you know, particularly within the tradition of Maitreya, it's well understood that the bodhisattva path is about not just deconstruction, like just kind of an, a, a realization, but also construction, meaning as the mind reformats itself, because you have to become more effective in service to the world, right? That this is the pathway is what they call omniscience. So the pathway of omniscience has to do with cognitive functioning fusing into awakening. And so when someone starts talking about something, you can see like what like how is what's their understanding? Like how do they understand that? Um, that can be, that's also backed up with you know questioning around what their contemplative experience is, but. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's not very difficult to get a sense of where someone's at. I really like that idea of cognitive function fusing with awakening. That's really, that's really helpful. Yeah, that's a, yeah, Wilbur talks about that in his work. Uh, O'Fallon talks about that in her work. Um, that's really in the, the Tibetan monastic education was to bring that about. Right. And Maitreya, like the future, the, the Maitreya Buddha, in those colleges, it was like Maitreya is like, you, the, the Buddhist, the, uh, you will not become a bodhisattva unless you're also simultaneously studying the, the liberal arts. So it was understood that it, we're talking about an educational process that doesn't end, a cultural process that doesn't end, right? Like in all of the various um, fields that each of you are studying in, that each of you are, you know, engaged in, that there is a line of development where that continues. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks Thank you. you. Uh, we got so many delicious questions in the chat and we might only have time for uh, one more, but uh, uh, Julian, I'll take you in because uh, existential risk has been a, a theme here at the STOA. Thanks, Peter. Hi, John. Uh, nice to meet you. I appreciate listening to you hey, today. Um, I was just wondering um, how you might view or understand some of the um, more existential risks uh, that we are facing collectively in sort of our modern society, whether they be around technology or weapons of mass destruction, climate change, these types of things. Um, within the model of planetary dharma and uh, this sort of time wheel, fourth turning uh, perspective. Thank you. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, so I, I view um, the situation that we're, that we're in is an evolution, you know, it's an it's evolutionary situation where this next level of development is being forced. Um, now, what I can say from is the the part of the each teaching needs to be calibrated to a particular moment in time to 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 help facilitate not only spiritual development that aside, but actually for where a culture needs to get to, like as a as a baseline, right? as a base. Um, so there is an understanding in the traditions, particularly that, 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 there's a, that, there's a, that there's a real shift in baseline that has to happen. That isn't about complete, some, some like kind of becoming a Buddha. It's just a next evolutionary step. Um, now that's, you know, we can put that on the map in terms of ego development and in terms of these traditions, but it's really about awakening to a, um, a level of, of our humanity, if you will, that is um, holographic to say, meaning that we begin to experience that the, the, the me is a we on a very deep relational level. We could say this um, from a Western perspective, if, if spirituality, and Buddhism it tends to have a focus on, on spirit as opposed to soul. And in the tradition, soul means something 
distinct from spirit. Spirit might be like space and soul would be like a sun, a soul, a sun. So um, the awakening to what they would call the, the buddhic, the buddhic field or bodhic bodhisattva, like this is what a becoming a bodhisattva means, is that there is an awakening to like a species mind. Now that species mind affects cogn it, it, it affects cognition. So this is what they call in the tradition the gift waves of influence, and we would call it, call it telepathy, meaning that you're that you begin you you hack. I mean, it's already happening to some of you. you, you we're hacking into a a level of of newosphere above the um, the pollution of of the mental, if you will, where um, metasystemic cognition, planetary cognition, like the, the cognition of a planetary mind operates. Now that involves, like as Teha Shadam put it, like an, an awakening to the fire of love, because it's really the, the center of that cognition is actually the heart. So we're talking about something that's cognitive, but actually it's felt sense is like, deep, deep interpenetrative compassion, right? And, and, and that's what then allows us to, to discover a completely new ways of relating to one another. Um, that, so, so, so that fourth turning within the understanding of the, let's say the perennial tradition, if I could say that, where they have like seven layers. So the fourth turning shifts the focus of, of Dharma practice being mental, which is the third plane, to the focus of the Dharma practice being soul, which is the fourth plane, which is the middle plane, which is the heart plane. So it's like an awakening. See, most, if you look at most advanced Dharma practice, uh, you know, Katie, if we go back to like the fourth path and the it's all fucking cognitive. It's all like very mental, like you have to be like a, got a strong mind to do that. The, the, the opening, like, well, I think someone's mentioning Eros here, the open, the awakening of the heart and of Eros and a kind of planetary Tantra where one is falling in love with, the, with like world as beloved that opens up a very different baseline from which Dharma practice to, can happen, right? Like the, the, um, the, 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 the teaching itself has to be recalibrated to come from a different place. If that, so rather, the, you know, because if you, if you analyze these contemplative systems, it's, you can, it's not necessarily awakening deep relational um, a deep relational field. It might be along the way or like pass through that, but it doesn't really put that at the center. So, you know, my, my perspective is that, sh that shift um, to, to understanding right human relationship is right at the very center and the heart right at the very center, which is, um, you know, what all the research on the on the energy medicine side is like the energy field of your heart center extends feet or, you know, it's there, can be measured, none of the other parts of your body. So there's a, so there's a, sh a shifting to a, a very deep relational um, model that we, that we need to make. And, and I don't think, I, and I think that these, that these things are coming online at this moment in time because it's, that's what we need. We don't, I don't think that the, that the four path model or like the, you know, even the Bodhi, these all, I don't think it's gonna, it's not, we don't have enough time. <laughs> we need practices which are going to bring us like into relationship and help us move through the traumatic obscurations that we have to deep intimate, intimacy with one another as, as part of that path. As soon as possible. Yeah. Any uh, follow-up shares, Julian? Uh, well, that's that's all. Thank you. I appreciate your perspective. All right.
right, let's uh, uh, close with uh, Jot's question. Hey, John. Hey, Joe. Good, um, good to see you too. Um, yeah, I, as you were speaking last, I was really feeling into the erotic nature of the heart hmm. and that being really a core piece of my, um, my understanding of Eros hmm. and the interrelatedness. And so I think my question was just wondering and as you just stated, we need these tools coming online um, to guide us in understanding how to relate to each other um, erotically and ethically at the same time. Um, and so I guess my question was really looking for some tools or wondering, because I, I know I've heard many stories about um, the great tantrics and the adepts and the just sort of pointing toward the experiences that they had with Eros. And so I'm wondering what, if there's anything you can offer us, I know I've, I've gained a lot from your meditations, um, from the practice of sitting with you, uh, my understanding of these things. So I'm curious what, where you would point us to mm. for more understanding. <laughs> That's a great question. I, well, I, as you know, in the, in the, there's both a left hand and a right hand approach to Tantra, right? And, or, right, the, that, um, and I think part of that goes back to the, there was a flowering of Tantric understanding in, Kash, in Kashmir, uh, or, actually I'm no, no historian, so I couldn't tell you when, but I think the idea was that the guru, they would sit in the circle and you'd have somebody on the right hand and somebody on the left hand. And, so on the left hand, you would have the body workers, the sex workers, the massage therapists, the dancers, um, particularly, this is particularly what we'd call the mother Tantra, right? Which was really, so the mother Tantra was, is a lot about the, the use, the use, the freeing of the, the fire of, 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 of Eros to liberate the trauma out of the body. And in doing so, um, liberate, you know, the fixations that are, that are causing awareness to be uh, constricted. Um, and we see that, we see that today in like neo-tantra, um, plant medicine work, so much of plant medicine work falls within the mother tantra, like the idea of like, well, if we can allow the, the erotic force of, of these plant medicines to open, to open us up, we're going to help, it's going to help us metabolize Right, you know, metabolized trauma. So that that is, you know, and and you know, sacred sexuality and and into all that whole realm of practice. And then we have like the kind of father tantra practice, which is, um, you know, in some senses, the, well, that's actually it's got more related to to pain, <laughs> relationship to pain and anger, than its relationship than than, um, than with with love. And the metabolization of that, but the I think the 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 not the deeper work because all of these are these are all important. The there's also then the fundamental erotic relationship with the field of experience itself, and I think that that's in some ways that's most important because at least for myself, at least as a as a man, for instance, if. With, if I'm not able to fully awaken to the, the feminine within, then um, in relationship with the whole of life, then it's going to be difficult in my relationship with women, right? That um, so that the the Mahamudra was always see the great embrace, the tantric embrace was always like the great embrace of the whole of our experience. Now that. Um, the great tantrikas, the reason, you know, they came to their practice with the view, with that holographic view. So if you're holding your experience from a kind of planetary species mind perspective, right, then the relationship with the erotic energy of life is, is magnified, if you will, like the basis of operation, 
the the um, put it another way, <laughs> the 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 sub level of prana, the kind of prana you're running through your the, the erotic experience, um, is different. Now within the traditions, they talk about seven different pranas, so eros kind of seven different levels, and what we're interested in is is a rainbow, right? That full rainbow of eros, right? Which is all those different levels. Um, I mean, from, from the most kind of the, the deep abiding love and passion towards the field and towards planetary evolution itself, right? That, that's the kind of the, in traditional um, Tantra, that's the view. And then from that place, they come then into relationship with the um with the personal the mystery schools generally go to like the the the, the vast first and then bring it all the way down um you know so in that sense the like the the you know the the white and the red right the archetypal the archetypal white and the red and, and these are seen in the western tradition as like the unicorn and the lion You'll even see these on the uh, coats of arms of like the royal families in Europe. Like they're talking about the the deep polarity of of spirit and matter. Um, so that you know that needs to be a uh, needs to be taken on board as a practice towards the whole of life. Right. That's the. You know, as Paman Sabhava, the great tantric master said, it's like, you want your view to be as vast as space, but you're discerning around cause and effect to be as fine as flower, right? And, and so, um, you know, in terms of tantric, tantric practice, you know, the do no harm piece, right? Um, that's like, being grounded in the understanding of personal trauma, being grounded in the understanding of interconnected field, being grounded understanding of the wider um, implications of, of everything that we do. I mean, that's, that's how I approach these, these practices. Any follow-up share, Joe? Yeah, I guess. Um, what do you think? I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious what you're seeing. Um, it, it's, I'm inspired by similar things to what you said. I love the uh, idea of the, the rainbow of perception. That's particularly joyful mm. for me. Um, mm. But the, the question that I have is, I, I hear a lot of people focus on trauma and me, myself, I focus on trauma and healing trauma and all of that. And sometimes um, I wonder about what we're doing to ourselves by making this so much a part of our identity. Hmm. Um, and then it mixes with the idea of getting kindness confused with niceness. Like hmm. we're trying to be nice to each other about our trauma when it's really not the kind thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then that mixes with my own feeling of urgency about like, okay, so I, I feel this um, big connection with Eros and I the interconnected field and all these things and what to do, but then I hit up against my own trauma or somebody else's <laughs> and I find myself being nice about it and not maybe knowing exactly how to be kind mm -hmm. really. I don't know if, if my response is related to what, what you're saying, but I, I think part of the challenge is, is we don't yet have the stru the, the, the structures, the, the, the actual kind of cultural structures to facilitate the depth of work that needs to be done at this level. So like in the Dzogchen tradition, what they would call Ruchen practice, um, the Dzogchen lamas take their students up to the, um, up into the mountains and they act out like for the realms. So they're running around screaming, you know, like masturbating, 
like crying, like this, like super powerful <laughs> psychodrama, right? Like, because if we're going to go as deep as we need to go, it's, it's going to go deep. It's going to, there's a lot of stuff there. Now, the, que the question I have is, well, okay, well then what are the structures like that, that needs to be held in a particular structural process, at least in my mind, meaning where, where, there's, where so safety can be established, that was the point of the mystery schools. Like that was the point of there is a certain level of initiation, having gone through levels of, of, of trust building, having moved at the speed of trust, where you can get to a place where um, there can be brutal honesty and a willingness to plunge into, right? To be, but to do that, we the you know you, one needs an initiatory structure and one needs a so we i don't think we have that yet i mean that's one of the things that i am hopefully in this you know like this lifetime committed to to helping support happen and build with other teachers is what are the structures that allows us to build a level of trust so you can get to do the depth of psychodynamic work and and pleasure work necessary to fully liberate right, us from all of the stuff we've accumulated without having to be nice <laughs> uh, any quick uh, uh share joke uh, we have to close soon I guess I'll just share um, when my friends was talking about wanting to go to a more hardcore monastery where they hit you with sticks. And I remember being appalled at that in the past and just coming into a place in myself where I'm like, oh, wow, it might be really helpful to get a little smack when I'm, you know, dazing off a bit if my intention really is to be on point. So mm -hmm. I look forward to <laughs> hearing more about the initiatory processes that you have coming channeling you know. well so it goes both right i think that's the hyper masculine which is like beat them with sticks but it would also be go the opposite which would be like you know make love right but but of, <laughs> but you know with our in our culture we you know that that level of like oh i'm all in has to happen at a certain point and it has to there has to be we have to check you know understand well what are the safety valves ne you know, necessary to get people to that place safely, right? Where there's no, where, where the, there's no shadows around that. So, you know, one can choose to, to push in a way that, um, that, you know, that might need, that might need to happen. That's always been a part of every tradition. Those initiatory processes where one's brought to the edge of death or brought to the edge of mind bending pleasure or more to the edge of like hallucinogenic experience. That's really important, but has to happen in the right context and held in the right way. Yeah. I guess there's just one thing, last thing I want to say, which is I've been having the bring coming to the awareness of an awareness about um, pain tolerance and noticing that I've had a really high pain tolerance at times and that I actually would like to have less pain tolerance because it guides me toward, like you said, more pleasurable outcomes, perhaps. So yeah. I think that's important in for teachers and guides also to have a certain level of pain tolerance so the, that we can sense our way toward a more beautiful future. Yeah, I agree. So, thanks, Joe. And Thank uh, Joe's doing some great uh, work with Eros Literacy and might have some future sessions at the STOA. Um, so we'll, we'll close out here. Uh, Skylar, any kind of uh, um, closing thoughts on your end? And then John, any kind of uh, parting words you would like to leave us with? Um, yeah, I feel like we just were getting warmed up. <laughs> that was so beautiful. I'm so grateful for the, the shares and just enjoyed listening. Um, and I want more. Um, I guess my question is on behalf of anyone else who wants more, John, what would be a good way to engage 
with the work that you're doing right now? Uh, well, uh, I, currently um, I have an ongoing class on Thursday nights. And if you're interested in dropping in, you can go to karunamandala.org and I'll be offering a, like an introductory retreat sometime in the summer, but the date hasn't been put up yet. Um, yeah. That's... You want, yeah. Uh, I don't know uh, if there's anything that you want to say to like anything that's still alive that feels like it needs to be in this space. Uh, well, well, I, I want to, I want to thank everybody, Peter. Thank you for the work that you're doing, Skyla. Thank you, and everybody. Thank you for your your time um, and just dedicate whatever this conversation, whatever it stirs up, to the work that we all need to do to um, you know to to serve this beautiful world that we're in. And um, I mean, I'm I, I've watched what you've done from afar here, so to be in is this is a great you know, thank you and i know that each of you in your own ways are being of service um in the world so thank you um good luck and if we cross paths that'd be wonderful otherwise go for go for happy trails happy trails <laughs> no it's i i actually it feels like um this this has felt to me like a weaving there, there's some uh, a lot of weaving together happening. I'm very happy that you're here at the STOA. Thank you so much, John. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Skylar. And uh, John, thank you so much uh, uh, for coming to the STOA today. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. We'd love to have you back. And um, I usually plug uh, announcements for upcoming events at the STOA. You can check out, we have a bunch uh, happening, but I'll plug uh, one uh, that's going to be embedded in our wisdom gym starting next week. It's embodiment hour with Skylar Brown. It's returning. Um, this is a session where we watch a prompt, a video, read a tweet, see what's happening in our body, and then uh, have a conversation uh, around it in a very embodied way. Uh, Skylar, any, anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, it just feels so nice. Like this is, you know, everything, like John just set such a beautiful context for why we even do something like Embodiment Hour. It's like it, we're, we're building the new culture. That's what I see. Um, learning how to relate with each other and feel our feelings and heal. Amen. And uh, Embodiment Hour is going to be a kind of a cross-pollination between uh, Skylar's new platform that she's launching on Substack and the, the STOA. So you can stay tuned for more information. Um, so that being said, yeah, John, Skylar, everyone, thank you so much for coming to STOA today.